Welcome back to Love Me For Classic and if you're new to my channel I hope you stick around and consider subscribing. I put new videos every week on some Jaguar and classic car related content and in today's video we're going to continue investigating a possible fail head gasket on my Daily Driver 1975 XJ6. But before we do that I just really really want to thank everyone who liked and commented and just really watched the last video. Your comments were so encouraging and I know I was pretty down and honestly I was really down when I filmed that but like I said I want to mention or show both sides it's not always positive things uh, on the channel you know it's real life you know things happen and thank you so much for all the tips all the suggestions and especially for all the kind words so I want to really thank you guys so much for that it really um, inspired me to go out right away and continue investigating in the car my plan was to just park her for a bit and work on something else, but I decided to uh, well, film this video. So we're going to go over there and we're going to try a few things. I bought a another test kit to test if there are uh, exhaust fumes, I think it's hydrocarbons to test for, in the coolant. So we're going to test that because that will know if it's a fail head gasket or possibly it could be uh, you know, crack as well. Because I want to see if it's that or if it's taking in water from the inlet manifold. It could be a crack in there. Or it could be a bad gasket there so I kind of want to know if it's around the head gasket or if it's something a lot simpler so we're gonna try and find that out uh, then my other idea is to check cylinder number six if you remember from a previous video a while ago when I did a or not that long ago a week or two ago I did a compression test on everything this was all before this happened I noticed a little bit lower compression in cylinder number six that was all a cold dry compression so my idea is to do a cold again but wet compression on that cylinder and see if there's a difference if it goes up well then I know something's wrong in the bores or the rings and that's also going to help me uh, figure out what the next step is going to be with this engine and the last thing is I want to hook up a mechanical gauge to the oil pressure gauge and just see what the oil pressure actually is on this car because sometimes the gauges are not that accurate in these cars all these things I just want to see if it's worth just removing the head like a lot of you guys are suggesting just try it one more time possibly get it skimmed or if i'm going to try and look for a replacement engine so um i think most of you guys want me to fix it and that's uh, uh that might be the case we'll see what happens uh that is what i would like to see happen but if i find out that the rings are bad as well in cylinder six and that the oil pressure is really bad then I don't know, maybe I won't do it, but we'll have to do the test now. So let's head on over to the smaller workshop or the little garage over there where it is at the moment and try these tests. So like I mentioned, I want to have a look at a few things before we whip off the head. Because in my opinion, there are about three ways that coolant could get into cylinder number two over here. One of them is a failed head gasket. The other one is, you know, crack in the head or the block. Or the third one is somehow, I think, through the inlet manifold or the inlet manifold gasket here because this is a water-cooled inlet manifold and there are ports in the head here for water to go through here through the head circulates and then you know up through the thermostat housing into a radiator so this thing is full of water uh, so what just a sort of a weird idea I have is I've loosened up both of the carburetors and we're gonna lift them up because the left one carburetor in the picture the back one feeds uh, cylinder two among cylinder one and three as well. So if I maybe have any water in the inlet manifold due to maybe a crack in the inlet manifold or a failed inlet manifold gasket, maybe I'll be able to look inside the carburetor here and see some coolant standing here, which I don't think I would get if I had a failed head gasket. I think it would just collect in the cylinder and it wouldn't go on to inlet manifold. At least that's the idea. So I've loosened up the uh, all the screws here. So we're gonna remove that dash pot, we'll just set that to the side. And would you know, if you have a look in there, you can see some water droplets. I'm gonna remove the other one, we'll see if there's anything in that, put it to the side, and then we'll have a close look inside both carburetors. Both tops are removed, and I'm being really careful knowing which one goes where, since you don't wanna mismatch those. If you wanna know more about matching the piston to the right suction chamber, I already made a video about that. I put a link to that up above so you can check that out if you haven't already. Um, yes, there's some gasoline standing in there. So I can see that is just, smell it, that's just gasoline. And that's because, I mean, I ran this thing for maybe 30 or 40 seconds, you know, with the choke on max. It's not the best thing to turn off, but I did because, you know, I think that's a fill head gasket. So there's some gas collected right there. 
If you look over here, I guess there is gas collected there, but you see those little lighter thing there? That's definitely, at least, I think that's water droplets or, you know, coolant, you know, moves aside there and there's one over there. So that's really strange because at least, in my opinion, I think that if it's a failed hand gasket, I don't think it can get water all the way out here. And if there was water in the fuel, um, you know, a lot of water in the fuel tank, I think that would be in both carbs because they share the same fuel hose, goes up here in the middle, and then just splits it right and left. Uh, so I think it would be in both then. So the next test I want to do is see if there are any combustion gases in the coolant. So I'm going to fill it up a little bit again because I think it's low. I just bought a test kit which you can mount on here to see if there are any exhaust gases in there. So we're going to see that and if there are no exhaust gases in the coolant then I think that definitely, well not definitely but at least I think it's not the head gasket and then we're going to move on to removing the inlet manifold because then the issue is either you know a crack, internal crack, or maybe corrosion in the inlet manifold. I mean it is 45 years old at least or maybe there's a filled gasket in there. So let's start with the test that we can do with everything together, see if there are any combustion gases in there. Hopefully there are not, and we'll go from there. I filled up the water again, just put in normal water since I'll probably be draining it out again so I didn't use any coolant. And I didn't fill up all the way because the test I got is said to remove a little bit of water from the radiator before you start. So it's, you know, it's a little bit below right here, but it should be enough. And here's the tester I got. I paid about from just a local you know, auto parts store about 80 or $90 for this. So uh, I think it'd be a good investment for future um, uh, testing as well. And it fits perfectly in there. So I'm gonna start up the car. I'll let it warm up a little bit. You're supposed to see that the coolant circulates and instructions and some steam or heat coming from here. Then you put the tester in there. Be careful not to burn yourself, of course. And then you pour, get the fumes from there to go up in here and hopefully there are no fumes hopefully it's just you know steam so we'll start it up and we'll see what happens uh, it's been running for about 30 seconds now you can see the coolant circulating i don't see any major bubbles so i think that's really good news i can see the coolant starting to circulate so i'm gonna wait a little, little bit longer for it to warm up a bit then we'll test if we have any fumes in there I think we can clearly see that that liquid is, it's starting to turn yellow, it's pretty yellow now, and maybe there's not that much fumes in there, but there's definitely soft fumes in the cooling system. So, uh, yeah, bad news. That is a failed head gasket or a crack or something. At least there's something in the head gasket area. So, uh, now we have some water on the belt. So I'm going to turn off the engine and uh, we'll go from there. It's a few hours later and I've let everything cool down. So I decided to see what's up with cylinder number six. So trying to decide if I want to keep this engine or not. And if you remember a couple of videos back when I did a compression check before all this happened, uh, cylinder six was a little bit low, it was 130 PSI. And I just checked out again, and yeah, that's yeah, 130 PSI, 125, 130. So my idea is now to remove the tester, put a few drops of just normal engine oil in there. Uh, crank it over again, do a wet compression test just on that cylinder and see if there's a drastic change. If there is, I know there's something up with the rings or the bore in that cylinder and it will at least help me in the decision if I'm going to do something about this engine or, you know, try and find another one. So uh, I'll remove that now, put some oil in, let's crank it over again and see how much the compression level goes up. This is just normal um, 2050 engine oil, same I have in the crankcase, so I'm going to put in yeah, three pumps like that. Put the tester back in. And let's see if I can lay it down somewhere so you guys can probably see it. Yeah, I should be able to see it there. All right, I'm gonna crank it over to the foot flat to the floor, just like before, and let's see what the compression is. <laughs> And it's actually pretty much exactly the same as before. So um, that means it's definitely not rings. It could be something else. Um, I have been meaning to recheck all of the valve clearances again after it's run for a bit. It could be that one of them is a little bit tight. So maybe that's a thing. So that's definitely a positive thing going forward that 
at least it's didn't get the compression didn't go up a lot with oil so probably rings are fine they might be leaking somewhere else so that's a good thing on to the last test here you might have heard me talk about before I'm a little bit worried about the oil pressure and I don't know how accurate the gauge is in the car um, I can get usually no more than about 40 psi of oil pressure uh, even when it's completely cold if I run it for about an hour or so on the highway when I come back to a stop and idle it would go down to somewhere around 20 so I just want to try that with a manual gauge. I have one here and I've hooked it up where the oil pressure sender is. I would have liked to hook it up where the warning light is, but that just really did not want to budge. And I think to get that off, I probably have to break it, get a socket on there, and I have to remove a bunch of stuff over here around the ignition system. I just didn't want to do that. So I removed the, um, the sender unit for the gauge, and I know that usually it's always 40 when cold, so we're just going to try this one cold. Optimally, I want to let it warm up and see what it is, but I just want to see if the gauge is pretty much accurate. So if this thing shows around 40, uh, then I know the gauge is accurate. If it shows higher or lower, then we know that about the gauge. So let's start it up and see what it says here. So let me make sure that, yeah, there we go. That's a zero. Let's see if the thing fires up. I've hooked up all the ignition components again. there it's that's slightly below 40 let's see if we rev it a little bit all right so we're getting what's that around 45 psi let's try and zero the gauge again this one doesn't seem to want to go back by itself so zero it and yeah 40 let it build up again. Not the best test gauge, but it's the one I have. All right, so it seems to be at somewhere around 40 psi. So, all right, the gauge in the car does seem to be accurate. So uh, I'll shut down the engine. Let's go back to the workshop and discuss what we found from these three tests. So I think we learned a lot from those tests. Um, the one thing that's kind of negative that we learned, of course, is that my whole wishful thinking idea that let's hope it's the intake manifold or the gasket over there or something simple is definitely not the case but you know one can dream and that would have been great if that was the case however we did find the exhaust fumes and the coolant so it is something around the head gasket a crack in the block or a crack in the head uh, so definitely not a good thing uh, but the good thing though is that I have that tester now for future projects because I don't think this will be the last uh, car that we need to test that on on the channel so that's a really good thing. Another thing that I actually think is good is that the compression level did not go up in cylinder six when I put oil in. So the rings seem to be sealing fine and all of that and the bore seems to be fine. I mean, they looked fine when I had the head off. So maybe it's something with the gasket over there or it's something with the valves. I was planning on rechecking the valve clearance again when the engine had run for a bit. That was gonna be at the first oil change which would be sometime now in September or something. Uh, but that's you know not happening but maybe one of the valves is a little bit tight over there or you know something's going on so I think that's a good thing because um, more and more lean towards the bottom end of this engine is actually fine and I think that the oil pressure reading is actually pretty good news as well I reread the owner's manual which was years ago that I read it and it clearly states that acceptable oil pressure is around 40 psi hot at 3000 rpm Yes, I know we just did a cold right now, but I just wanted to check what the gauge, if the gauge was all right, because I've been looking at the gauge the whole time while driving this thing for about four months. And yeah, so it showed 40 PSI there cold, which I know it always is cold. So then I know that I can pretty much trust the gauge. And when I'm driving and everything's fully warmed up at highway speeds, I do have about 35 to 40 PSI of oil pressure. So I would call that definitely acceptable. It's not a brand new engine, but it's definitely acceptable oil pressure. Drops down to about 20 psi if you're sitting in traffic or at a red light when it's fully warmed up. Um, doesn't go down to zero, it doesn't knock or anything. And as soon as you accelerate again, the oil pressure shoots up again to around 30 or 40 psi. Um, it probably could be a little higher and it could just be the oil pressure relief valve or something like along those lines uh, because it doesn't really matter at 
what RPM or at what temperature, it never really goes above 40 PSI. It seems like it just opens up there. So that's something I could have a look at if I decide to use this engine, see if I can replace the oil pressure relief valve or clean it up or something and maybe get a little bit higher oil pressure at least, which wouldn't be a bad thing. Okay, so moving on from here, uh, according to the comments in the last video, you guys just pretty much want me to probably take the head off, have a look at it, possibly get it skimmed, put it back together with a new head gasket and, you know, torque it down. Got a great tip with to use some uh, some special Loctite uh, 8 something, uh, well, I'll have it written down, around the head studs just to seal them a little bit better. And just fingers crossed and let's hope for the best. So um, that's something I might consider doing. I'm still just waiting to hear back about that used engine because it seems to be a really good one. And um, I don't know, I just, it would be kind of just easier to just swap it in if I know it's a good unit. But I'm waiting to hear back how much he wants for it and um, you know if it's sort of going to be worth it. Because I called around a bit and to have the head looked at and skimmed uh, locally and not every single place can take such a long cylinder head. But I'm talking about $100 to $150 to have that looked at which also means I have to disassemble the head as well at home. So that's a few hours there to disassemble and put it back together. So. Doing all that is almost a complete uh, complete working day, you know, taking it apart, putting it back together, and taking it there. Uh, so that takes quite a bit of time as well, and I won't know if there's a crack in the block or not if I don't take the engine out of the car, and disassemble everything, and have a look at that. And that's not really something that, at least at the moment, I feel like doing, but I think I am going to shop around and just see, well, how much is a set of... Um, um, how much set of bearings for the whole engine and how much is you know piston rings and stuff because uh, maybe I will take it apart and do everything even though it's not really something I plan on doing but uh, if it doesn't prove to be too expensive and if I can check over the block and have that sent away see if it's fine maybe it's something I will do but uh, honestly I do think the block is fine it is a late series 3 block which already has the slots between the cylinders it's not prone to cracking it's not prone to warping uh, so the issue is probably um, uh, something happened during the head install, maybe there's some dirt in there, or something's wrong with the cylinder head. Uh, but please let me know what you think in the comments down below, and if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. If you're not already subscribed, please subscribe to the channel, it really helps a lot. And if you're subscribed already, make sure you have that bell notification selected, then you get updates whenever I post a video or I post something in the community tab as well, where I sometimes put some updates. And also, if you want some uh, more daily updates or every other day updates, usually, you can follow me on Instagram. Do the link down below. It's called Living with a Classic. And you get some behind the scenes and some extra looks. And there with some teasers on future videos coming up. Anyways, until next time, I'm Adam, and this was Living with a Classic. I'll see you soon.